Kramer Media in Johannesburg, this is the Real Economy Report. The community of Devland in Soweto will have access to a modern multi-purpose learning center by July next year in commemoration of Mandela Day as part of a community outreach project undertaken by non-profit organization Growing Up Africa. Sashni Moodley tells us more. The Soweto Community Education Campus Project aims to not only improve the future prospects of youth in the Devlin community, but to also empower women in the community and create job opportunities. The 7,000 square meter site for the campus will take up a block in Devlin, on the corner of Yanzenecker Drive and Process Road. At the forefront of the project is Growing Up Africa founder and CEO, Deborah Tahoon, who enlisted sponsorship and pro bono assistance from various businesses, private sector investors and architects. The vision is to provide um, an education facility that the uh, entire community can benefit from. Uh, and what that we identified the need, we had to then design to that need. Construction started about a year ago. Um, we had some remedial work to do at, at one stage during construction. And then um, when people are doing things for free, uh, you kind of have to go with that flow and honor their uh, time frame and uh, all of a sudden the road work started. So we had a bit of a, a delay um, but we're looking at a, um, an opening of the school uh, in July on Mandela Day 2016. Tahoon says it was important to get buy-in from the community at the initial phase of the project. At least 200 volunteers from the community cleared the sites, previously a garbage dump site to show their commitment to the project and towards community involvement. New York-based architect William Rue became involved with Growing Up Africa and this particular project four years ago and provided the design concept for the project pro bono. So the building contains five different flexible spaces. Uh, there is one auto, um, cafeteria that seats about 100. It is connected to a kitchen and that cafeteria-kitchen relationship works as a potential um, vocational culinary uh, classroom, but it also works as a, a kitchen that can provide uh, food for lunches for the school across the street, or also uh, catering services for functions that can happen within the building. There is a medium-sized auditorium that seats 56, and it has a very tall ceiling and can be divided in half. And so that room can be split in two different ways to be one large group or smaller groups. There are two flexible classrooms, each housing 35 uh, seats. The division between those classrooms can be taken down. So it's another uh, room of a different size and shape, uh, access and ceiling height, and it facilitates a different type of function. And then finally is the large auditorium, which seats about 216, I think, uh, and it's this large meeting space. So it provides um, a space for um, art performances or any type of large meeting gathering space for the community. Uh, it uh, derives its character from its large swooping roof. So on the outside when you see this big roof that is pitching forward on the top of that volume, inside that volume is the auditorium. So it's this large community space is tied into the identity of the building. The building is primarily funded through pro bono professional services and in-kind sponsorships from national and international construction companies, suppliers in the construction industry, and architects. I think it's just tremendous value in becoming involved with humanitarian architecture. One, uh, for us personally, we want to magnify our reach as designers. So in New York, uh, where our work in single family residential might impact eight people at most for a nice home. We want to impact 80 people, 800 or 8,000. And our work is value-driven work, even though it's single-family residential typically. We believe uh, that good design, that, that everyone, rich or poor, deserves the benefit of good design. So when we have our clients who can hire us for a custom home, they're gonna get the best we got. But there is no reason why those people in the community of uh, where this building is being built in Devlin, uh, don't deserve that degree of thoughtfully considered planning. So we think that has tremendous value because it informs our work 
and also we know how it has a transformative power in that community. A consortium comprising the private and business sector, governments and community groups will manage the property. The project will also be added to the city of Johannesburg's property portfolio. The River Sands Incubation Hub has been successfully launched and is starting to gain traction on absorbing entrepreneurial hopefuls as it opens its doors to emerging and existing small businesses. Natasha Urdendahl has the story. Since opening its doors in March, the River Sands Incubation Hub has steadily added a number of small, medium-sized and micro-enterprises to its incubation portfolio with more than 50 new businesses to be introduced to the hub this year. The hub, near Dipslert, had the capacity to nurture and develop up to 150 entrepreneurs and small businesses at all stages of development into fully-fledged formal businesses. An upstart bakery, a flooring firm, a printing company, a fashion and sewing school, and a technology and construction firm were some of the 12 firms now settled in since opening doubling their turnover and extensively widening their market bases. River Sands Incubation Hub CEO Jenny Retiff tells us more. We have about 65 businesses on our Grow Your Business program and many more that we have are in preliminary stages of engagement with. Um, there are about 12 that have fully moved in and others that are in the process of onboarding. Obviously the onboarding process itself can take a bit of time because businesses sometimes have premises elsewhere and we also very um, careful to advise business owners not to get distracted with coming to something new and take their eye off the ball on their existing clients and markets wherever they might currently be operating from. So that process needs to be a properly managed process of moving here. Um, they are without exception doing, doing significantly better than they were doing before moving here. Some of them have doubled turnover even by the end of the second full month here. And that just comes about through us opening doors for, for them to get in front of other, other clients and other potential um, formal sector uh, companies and prospective clients. Closing the deal and growing the business and retaining the customer comes back to the value that the SME delivers. The customer service, the quality, the reliability, all of those things. But sometimes just having that opportunity to get your foot in the door and have the first conversation so that you can demonstrate your quality is part of what we can bring about in the, with various market visibility and access initiatives. Other news making headlines this week, Sassel sees low oil prices persisting to 2017 and gas represents a 250 billion rand opportunity for South Africa. Energy and Chemicals Group Sassel's outgoing president and CEO David Constable indicated that the group expected oil prices to remain low until the end of the 2017 calendar year. Oil price lower for longer, uh, we talk about 50 to 60 through calendar year 2017. Probably not a bad thing to, you know, ballpark range to, to look at. Uh, you know, there's some there's some wild cards at OPEC and how how long they can take that pain. Uh, a lot of countries uh, within OPEC that are really having trouble, obviously balancing their budgets and are in extreme in an extreme uh, extremely challenging situation. So that's that's one thing that might uh, bring that oil price up faster than, than expected. Global management consultancy McKinsey and Company argues that South Africa should urgently pursue a big gas energy option to bridge an electricity supply gap of between 6 and 10 gigawatts that could arise by 2025 as older coal-fired power stations are decommissioned. South Africa will encounter another energy gap as soon as 2025, even with the uh, commissioning of Madupi and Kusili because about 14 gigawatt of capacity will, will get decommissioned by 2025. And th this gives us about 10 years to actually do something about this. And 10 years, unfortunately, is not a very long time when it comes to finding new options to generate power. And in our view, gas is actually, um, will offer the most strategically flexible option and will also be the most attractive. That's Crema Media's Real Economy Report. Join us again next week for more news and insights into South Africa's real economy.